Amen. As the ushers are serving you today, we made a couple uh, announcement a couple weeks ago that today is going to be Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Is anybody here thankful for the pastors that we have here at Valley Church? Let them know how thankful you are for them. Has Pastor Jason and Ms. Susie touched anybody in this house over their time here? As we honor them today and we recognize them, I want to bring up Marcia. Marcia is going to share a few words of just a story of, of how Pastor has touched her life and made an impact in her. So everybody, please help me welcome Marcia. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Jared. I read a quote the other day, and it said, good leaders build products. Great leaders build cultures. Good leaders deliver results. Great leaders develop people. Good leaders have vision. Great leaders have values. Good leaders are role models at work, but great leaders are role models in life. Valley Church, we have an amazing pastor in Pastor Jason Cook. So I stand here today and I represent all of you in saying to Pastor Jason, Lady Susie, and their entire family that we appreciate and we honor the gift that you are to us in our lives. When I read that quote, it is a quote that I believe uh, culminates my eight years of experience with Pastor Jason. When I came to Valley Church eight years ago, I was a broken person. I was a hot mess. I was struggling in my personal life. I was trying to decide which ministry I was supposed to attend. Um, I was dealing with the loss of my father. And I would come and I would sit in the back where the lady in the green, I probably would sit there every Wednesday night because I wasn't thinking about joining. I just knew that I needed help. And I want to say to pastor that it was him that drew me, but it was not. It was the fact that the word of God was being spoken every Wednesday night that I came at Bible study. And it was the word that I found that was washing me and cleansing me and sanctifying me. And I probably came here for about six months and I would sneak in and sneak out because I was at another ministry. And I remember someone asking me, well, why that church? I didn't have an answer, but I knew in the middle of the night that I would cry out to God and I would say, God, I feel like an orphan. And then I found in the word that Jesus said, I will never leave you as an orphan, but I will come to you. And I kept saying, Jesus, you're not coming to me. I don't hear your voice. And then I read the scripture that says, my sheep, they know my voice and a stranger's, they will not follow. And so one Sunday, I was compelled to ask the pastor if I could come and meet with him because I knew in my heart that I needed family, I needed community, I needed covering. I just didn't know how. And so I met with Pastor Jason in his office and I just broke down and I said, Pastor, I feel like an orphan. I'm abandoned. I'm by myself. And there were three things that Pastor Jason said to me on that day. And I have seen him model that. The first thing he said to me was, you are not an orphan. You have a heavenly father. And the second thing he said to me was, I don't want to be known as the pastor of white people. I don't want to be known as the pastor of black people. He says, I want to be known as the man of God who preached and shepherded God's people. That kind of sealed it for me. But then he went a little further and I said, I don't know if I'm ready to join. And he says, Marcia, I promise you this. If you will give me a chance, 
and allow me to shepherd you. I will pray for you. I will guide you. And I will do all in my power to impart the love of God into you. And he ended by saying, you don't even have to join my church. He said, but if you will let me, I will help you find where you're supposed to be. To me, that's a great leader to not try to covet someone, but to say, I'm here. So Pastor Jason, I have watched you, Lady Susie, and your children pastor us. I have watched Noah, Madison, Scotty, and yes, Squisher, following the example of their father. And so I just want to say, Pastor, we appreciate you. One of the things that Pastor did that I think I am so glad I have this mic because I want to do it this morning. And so I'm going to ask everybody else to stand up on their feet with me and we're going to give our church cheer. All right, you guys are ready? I think you know this, right? Because he's led us, right? Are we blessed, Valley Church? Miss Susie, we have a beautiful bouquet of flowers for you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for serving him so well. Pastor Mike is coming up. Pastor Jason, this is something special. This is a surprise. You don't know about this. This past year was a big year here at Valley Church as we had a great opportunity to break ground on a brand new kids building. And so this is a shadow box of the scissors that were used to cut, the, ro to cut the, the ribbon, a piece of the ribbon, the song that we sang that, that night as we got ready to, to open up that building, and also pictures from that evening. So, Pastor, this is for you guys. Mike, if you'll show the congregation, but Pastor, this is for you. Thank you for your vision. I know that was a long process, but it came to pass this past June. And so this is just a keepsake that we wanted to give to you on this pastor appreciation to say thank you and to remember what a great, what a great night that was. Pastor Jason, Susie, we love you guys. We are so thankful for you. Let's give them one more round of applause for how much we love them. I have prepared a interpretive dance for this moment. <laughs> you gotta the, these are always awkward for us. And, and I just want to thank you. I feel your love. I know St. Susie feels your love. Marcy, in powerful words, I remember that time. I remember the, the Wednesday you walked into this house eight years ago. I remember that. I just want to say this. God is doing something great here. And we are just glad to be part of it. But it's bigger than us. We, we have an incredible pastoral staff that, that they're always hands-on. Uh, I was asked one time in an interview process, they said, where did, where did you learn your leadership ability? And I, I didn't know how to answer that, so I learned it in fifth grade. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, we always went out to the playground for recess, and it was always a kickball or basketball or football. And I said, I always wanted to be the captain because I could pick my team. And I always pick people faster than me, stronger than me, more talented than me, and I put them around me. And I always realized when I did that, I would win. And we have an incredible staff, and I want to take time just to reflect what God is doing to our staff. And we're going to try to recognize some of them next week, our, our, our licensed ministers. But I just want to say thank you, Valley Church. And can I do one more thing? Because, Marcia, as well as you did that, you left something out. And I just, you know, great leaders. 
will fix something. One more time, let's give it up for our pastors. Just stay standing here just for a moment. You know, this is Pastor Jason's eighth year here at Valley Church, and every Pastor Appreciation Sunday always talks about how awkward it can be that he goes, man, I get recognized and I got to preach. So we're doing something a little different this Sunday. He's a good friend of ours, and he's not new to Valley Church, but Please help me welcome all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Chris Bowen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Valley. Praise the Lord, Valley. Are we on? Praise God, Valley Church. How many of y'all are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? I said, how many of y'all are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Give God praise if you thank God for your pastors today. Hallelujah. Oh, that was weak. Somebody give God praise for your pastors if you love them today. Give God thanks and praise for them. Amen. 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 God is good. And God is faithful. Amen. Amen. You may have your seat today. Uh, I asked them to give me some monitors, so they just cut it totally off. Praise the Lord. Amen. It is so good to be here today and celebrating a special day, Pastor Appreciation Day 2024. Anybody love your pastors here? Oh, that was weak. Anybody love your pastors here? Amen. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. Such an honor to be here. I sat in that seat for 27 years, and I'm excited today to be able to come and to share the blessings of God for their life and what I think that we should do to honor a pastor on this special day. As he said earlier, it's the most awkward day for a pastor because they're used to serving. But is it okay after they serve 364 days to take one day, one day, and just to really honor our pastors that have labored in the vineyard for all these days the rest of the year? Can we do that today. Is that okay with everybody? Amen. Amen. He is worthy of that, and we thank God for him and Pastor Susie. So uh, I, I heard a story recently that a gentleman, he went to church, and he loved the service so well. He thought it was a fantastic service, so he went to the office the next day and wanted to talk to the pastor. So the receptionist came up, came up and said, how can I help you? And he said, I'm here to see the head hog. And she said, the head hog? You'll have to hold on a moment. So she went back and got the associate pastor. Associate pastor came out, and, and he said, how may I help you? And he said, I was here at church yesterday and loved it. I want to talk to the head hog. And he said, sir, let me tell you, we don't call our pastor the head hog. It is the pastor. We would appreciate it if you approach him as our pastor. And he said, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be offend offensive to anyone, but I just brought him a $100,000 check. He said, wait a minute. I see the big pig coming right now. Amen. And it's amazing what that'll do to you. It'll, it'll change your perspective. So today, I hope that, that we have just a few minutes together to look at the perspective of where we're going and what we're talking about. Would you stand uh, for the reading of his word today? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. I'm going to be reading from the message today because I want to show you that it is truly God's will that we honor such a man and woman of God like we're doing today. This is biblical, amen? And the Bible says in the message, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 13, and now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibilities of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. Amen. Can you do that one more time before you sit down? Can you overwhelm them with appreciation and love? Amen. Can you overwhelm them with appreciation and love right now? Can you show them how much you love them? Can you show them how much you appreciate them today? Amen. It is an honor to be able to stand in front of you on this special day and on this special occasion. You may have your seat. I, I want us to realize that, again, it is biblical that we honor such a time as this and the pastors that God has given you. I want to give you some facts about churches and pastors and what all they go through. How many of y'all realize that the pastor of a church is a very difficult position? He can't please everyone, but you have hired him to try to please everyone who comes through the doors. If his hair is gray, he is too old and he just can't relate to the young people. But if he is young, he lacks experience. 
If he has several children, he has too many, but if he has no children, he sets a bad example. If he preaches from his notes, he has a canned sermon and is too dry, but if he does not use notes, then he has not studied and is not very deep. If he is attentive to the poor people in the church, he claims to be uh, playing the grandstand, but if he pays attention to the wealthy, then he is a nobleman. If he suggests change improvements in the church, he is a dictator, but if he has no suggestions, then he becomes a figurehead. If he uses many illustrations, he neglects the Bible, but if he doesn't use enough illustrations, then he's not very clear. If he condemns wrong, he is cranky, but if he doesn't preach against sin, he's a compromiser. If he fails to please somebody, he hurts the church and he ought to leave, but if he tries to please everyone, then he appears to be a fool. If he preaches on money, he is a money grabber, but if he doesn't preach on uh, spiritual giving, then he fails to develop people. If he drives an old car, he shames his congregation, but if he drives a new car, he sets the affection on earthly things. If he preaches all the time, then people get tired of hearing just one man. If he invites a guest speaker, then he's shirking his responsibility. If he receives a large salary, he's greedy. If he receives a small salary, well, that's all he's really worth anyway. The truth of the matter is, a pastor has to go over and beyond to please everybody in the church. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you realize it's hard to please everybody? Because it's too hot in this room. It's too cold. I don't like the chair. I wish we was like this. I, I wish it wasn't so loud. I wish it was louder. And his job is to always try to give you a great experience in the church. So no matter what he does, half of the people are, yay, let's go. And the other half is saying, why did you have to do it like that? So today, that's why we're honoring pastor to say, we're setting things aside today, and we're giving honor where honor is due, and I'm going to show you through the word of how God will honor you for doing so. Do you realize that 80% of pastors believe that ministry has a negative effect in their family life? 33% say that their being in ministry is an outright hazard to the family. 50% feel unable to meet the demands of their job, while 70% say that they have a lower self-image now than they did the day they started. 40% report a serious conflict with a, pr a parishioner in the last 30 days. 70% do not have somebody to consider to be a close friend. 50% have considered leaving the ministry in the last three months. 50% of who uh, of those who are full-time ministry will give up within five years. 94% of clergy families feel the pressure that the pastor has in ministry, and an average of 1,500 pastors leave the pulpit every single month and retire. Can I tell you today, it is in God's will that the church recognize and appreciate the man of God that God has placed in in front of you. And so today it is appropriate while we have to identify that he is just a man, but he is also the man that God has called to Valley Church. I remember when we dedicated the building beside us just a few months ago, and what a great day of celebration that was. But do you also realize there's a greater vision still ahead of you? Is anybody here believing that this man and this woman of God has opened up the heavens and is showing you what God has for you? Is anybody better because you come to Valley Church? Can I hear you today, man. That doesn't come without a lot of preparation. So today we're going to look in the Bible about a man named Moses. How many of y'all familiar with Moses? Moses had a million followers behind him, a million. But the Bible teaches us that he only had two that really, really supported him. So I ask you today, which one are you? Remember the average uh, member stays at a church two years and two months, while the average pastor stays one year and eight months. Your pastor has stayed here for eight years already, amen? Isn't that great to have a leader that says, I have a vision, I have a dream. And he's got even a greater dream than where you've come from to where you're still headed. I hear him talking about building onto the parking lot, possibly building a new sanctuary. Can you imagine where you can go if somebody has a dream? Are you glad to be in a church that the leader has a dream? I want you to realize today that when you have a dream, the sky is the limit. And today at Valley Church, I think your future is filled with a lot of bright days ahead of you. Amen. Does anybody believe that the greatest days are still ahead of you? Does anybody believe that God is about to do miracles, signs, and wonders in this building? 
It takes somebody who has a spiritual leader that says, I have a dream and I'm going to go there. I really want to say to your pastors today, after pastoring 27 years, I can tell you, that I never had a close friend in those years because it seemed like that, that, that it's very hard in that position to have a close friend. And I want to say three years ago when I met Pastor Jason and Pastor Susie at a conference, we was at a round table and we were sit, uh, sitting together. And from that day, I knew that there was something special about this couple. And today, if I had to pick out a song for them, it would be that from Golden Girls, Thank You for Being a Friend. Do you guys find that about Pastor and Susie? They're friends, right? They're those people who love regardless of where you're at. The pressure of pastoring faces a lot of great challenges. However, God's resources and his provision is even better. And one of the greatest resources that God has today is his people. So you are the greatest resource that God has for you to the pastor. Every person in this church can, can be encouraged by the pastor and the heart that he has. So I want to walk you through a scenario today, and that's the story of Moses. It was a time of war in Israel, but in the ancient war, the enemy was easy to spot. The Amalekites were or on, the, on the attack, and the Amalekites were coming against the Israelites. And I want you to remember this. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 25 and 17, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came up out of Egypt. And when you were weary and you were worn out, watch this. I want you to see who the enemy attacks. They met you on your journey and attacked all that were lagging behind and those who did not fear God. I want you to understand those who do not have fear against God and those who are lacking behind. How many of y'all know the enemy will come in the weakest link? When the enemy attacks, he doesn't find what's strong and what's working well. He will find the weakest link, and that's where he would attack. So we find here the Amalekites come in, and they're looking at the Egyptians, and they're saying, wait a minute, where is the weakest link? How many of y'all know that even though you have a great pastor, not everybody is going to like him? Ooh, come on, somebody say amen. Not everybody's going to like him. How do you know that? Because every pastor has people that will leave a service and talk about him. Oh, it's quite preach, preacher. I think I will. Amen. Y'all quiet in here today. I want you to identify that Moses had the same situation. He had a million followers, but remember they were happy and loved him as long as they had something to eat. But when they had to go out and hunt for the quail and whenever the manna wasn't falling just right, they had a problem with Moses. Whenever they had to cut down the trees and build a bonfire to cook, they had a problem with Moses. In fact, a 16-day journey took them 40 years. And what they were saying was, Moses, why didn't you leave us back there where we were at? I am glad at Valley Church that you do not have a pastor that's willing to leave you in your past. You have a pastor that's saying your future is ahead of you. The greatest days are ahead of you. Your marriage is going to be blessed. Your finances are going to be blessed. Your family is going to be blessed. Your children are going to be blessed. Anybody thank God? That's the visionaries you have for this house. So uh, 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 Amalek here attacked Israel from behind, attacking again the weak, the, 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 the slugger, the faint. And Joshua was in the thick of the battle. When Moses standing at the top of the hill with a staff in his hand, and all of a sudden we find that he raised his hand, all of a sudden Joshua began to win. Come up here, sir. You're going to be my Moses today. Will you be my Moses? So I've got you a staff, and I, I, I just want you to hold this over your head. You young and just newly married, and look at it. All right, all right. Go ahead, but I bet you I have the last laugh in a minute. Go ahead. Just hold it up right there, all right? Just hold it up, all right? So he's strong. We got an older man up here earlier today. He couldn't do this. So we get a young man for this one. See how well he does. See how he's smiling right now? You see how cocky he looks right now? Give him just a minute. He, we we going to wear him out here in a minute. So Joshua was in the thick of battle when Moses, standing at the top of the hill, took his staff in his hand and put it over his head. Joshua then started winning the battle against the Amalekites. Can I tell you that between the enemy and the circumstance that you're going to for your victory, there's got to be somebody standing in the gap. 
Can I tell you who that person is today? That person is sitting right over here in the corner called your pastors, amen? And whatever they're standing between the gap, but they, you've got to identify that if they don't have a relationship with God, you will not win those battles. But how many people do I have that's victorious in this room right now? How many, how many victorious people do I have that you have overcome some battles in your life? Can I tell you, it's good to have somebody that has a relationship with God. And we all have a relationship with God, but God has called the pastor to intercede. Here, Moses was called out from the backside of the desert. He was living his life. He was okay with where he was at when God said, no, lead my people out. So he has a million followers following him, and he's looking down at Joshua in the midst of the battle, and he's seeing him lose, but he recognizes that as soon as he, look, I saw his teeth a few minutes ago. Now, I'm barely getting a smile out of him. What's happening? That, that, that big smile is turned into a little grin, all right? Just stay there a few more minutes. You're almost done, all right? 30 more minutes. Come on. So we find that even the strongest men will eventually have to lower their hands, Pick him hands up. What you doing taking a break? Look at him. What is, is this your husband? Are you proud of him? You are? Give me a couple more minutes. All right, I'll ask again. <laughs> I want you to identify that even the strongest men will have to get weak in the midst of carrying a heavy battle. Can I tell you that your pastor is not perfect? Can I tell you that he's human? Is it okay that sometimes he misses the mark? Is it okay to identify that sometimes he gets weary and well-doing? As a pastor of 27 years, I can tell you there was times that I stood in the lobby knowing that that person just talked about me, stabbed me in my back, and I had to look with a smile on my face, hug their neck, and say, good to see you at church today. Oh, I must have some guilty folk in the house. Oh, look at this. I love you. Yo, if you amen me, I know you're not guilty. Amen. So amen. So what happens here is Moses starts getting tired. Are we tired yet? A little bit, a little bit. Would you like some help? So I want you to look. All of you are here, but nobody has offered to help him. But Aaron, ha uh, Aaron and her said, wait a minute. That's my leader. And so they ran up. Aaron and her ran up to help. Aaron and her, Aaron and her ran up to help. Aaron and her a little slow, but they finally ran up to help. Woo, don't you feel better already? Woo. So, so now, look, all of a sudden, Moses has some help because every time he put his hands down, he began to lose. So he knew that he had to keep his hands up. Can I tell you that pastor has to be on watch for your soul because the devil is seeking whom he may devour. And the Bible says he's going to come where the weak is. And pastor's got to be up. Sometimes you don't understand that before he preaches on Sunday, he's been up all night interceding for the service, praying that God would deliver somebody and set somebody free. Do you realize that sometimes on Saturday night, he is sitting in a hospital while you're in your bed asleep and he knows he's got to come and deliver three sermons on Sunday, but yet he is seeking God for the sick. We have got to hold up his hands. You're getting your smile back. Look, he's starting to smile a little bit. Look, look, I see his teeth again and that tongue just popped out like a little arrogance come back in there because now he's got some help. I want you to identify that you're either a help to him or a hindrance to him. You're either somebody he loves to see in a room or he's glad when you walk out of the room. Well, which, which, which one are you? Which one are you? Moses literally stood in the gap between Israel and the Amalekites in the spiritual realm. He stood between death and life for his people and he realized that the victory was in him. I want you to identify today that you may be in the trenches fighting and your pastor, it may seem like all he does, he just preaches on Sunday. What a cheesy job. All he does is teach it on Wednesday. That's got to be an easy job. Can I tell you that Sunday is the easiest day for a pastor? 
It is on Monday. It is on Tuesday. It's the intercessory. It's the heaviness of somebody going through counseling and, and somebody going through a divorce and, and, and we're trying to keep somebody off suicide. Those are the strenuous times that people don't see when the church is closed. Uh, that pastor is still busy working. You guys get the point of what's happening up here? You ready to sit down? You are? Please? Okay, five more minutes. All right, let's just... You guys can have a seat. Thing. Give them a hand. Great job. Your victory or defeat may depend on the pastor's prayer life. That's why I want you to realize this is why we set one day aside, one day this year to say, Pastor, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you for being the pastor that you are, and we want to take a day to honor you. I want to share a story here because a lot of people don't understand the demand that ministry gives. A few years before I retired as senior pastor, my son was pitching the World Series in Cincinnati, Ohio. We were in the last game of the World Series in the last inning, and he was the closing pitcher. When all of a sudden my phone rang and I picked up the phone and I walked away for just a moment because one of my parishioners was in a crisis that wasn't really a crisis, but she thought it was. And all of a sudden, from inside the ball stadium, I hear everyone jumping and shouting and screaming. And I walk back through the gate, and I see everybody on the pitcher's mound covering my son up. And he pitched the last pitch and won the World Series. And I missed it. Six months later, that same family left me. I left my family at a moment of celebration to go to somebody with crisis, and they still left me. A year later, God gave me a do-over. My son was in his senior year. He was pitching the World Series again, Cincinnati again, and and, and I went, and the seventh inning, here it is, the last inning, one more time, and he's pitching as the closing pitcher. This time I turned my phone off because I realized what was valuable to me. My son won for the second time, the World Series. I was there to celebrate. God gave me a do-over. He didn't have to, but he chose to. He gave me a do-over, and I got to see that happen. He went back the next year to become the head baseball coach for that school. I want you to understand today the sacrifice that you don't see that the pastor gives all the time. The sacrifice that nobody else sees, that, that he steps away from his family. The time that he, he leaves everything else to make sure that your needs are met, that your child is prayed for, that your event is attended. I want you to understand that Moses left it all to be a servant. And today you guys have a Moses of this house. And their names are Jason and Susie Cook. They intercede between heaven and hell for each one of you. Ezekiel chapter 22 and 30 says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but found none there. How many times did Moses literally stand between Israel and the judgment? How many times has your pastor stood between the enemy and you? I believe that prayer changes things. And I believe that sometimes they prayed over you when you didn't even know that you needed prayer. And because of that, you didn't have to go through certain things in your life. That's why I think a pastor is somebody who needs to be honored. And Romans chapter 8 and 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I want you to identify today that so many times that what ministers need is somebody just to lift up hands. Somebody to be there to encourage them and to love on them and to say, Pastor, I'm here for you for whatever you're going through. Today we're here to celebrate Pastor Jason and Pastor Susie, one day, just to say thank you. One day, to say thank you for serving and all that you do. When I walk into a service now, a lot of people will ask me if I'm a guest, will you want to sit on the front row? And I always say, no, I don't want to be on the front row. 
because I know the price that the front row cost. I know the sleepless nights. I know the times that you don't feel appreciated. I know the times that you're going through things, but you still have to smile and you still have to love people. When somebody in the church passes away and everybody's grieving, the pastor still has to put on a smile and encourage you when inside he's hurting himself. Do you know how many funerals I have done and I was aching on the inside? And I'll have to step in my office and just have my moment and then take the stage and say, wow, wasn't it a blessing that they were here with us? But on the inside, my heart was breaking too. But my job as a pastor was to keep you encouraged and to love you through the process. Today, I want to be transparent and real with you. You are blessed with a pastor. You're blessed with a first lady that loves God and that serves him on your behalf. I want to say today, as I wrap things up, I want to say to Pastor Susie and Pastor Jason, thank you for being a servant of God. And I think one of the greatest honors that I get to have in this season of my life is to be here today to share with you what it means to appreciate the man that God has set before you to move you into your next dimension. Today is a day like none other. Today we celebrate and I think heaven is rejoicing because you've taken a moment out to say, hey, we want to celebrate our Moses because Moses had a, th a million people behind him, but only two that would lift up tired hands. Only two that would say, we appreciate everything that you're doing. Can I share with you some things as I close that I went through as a pastor? While the news media filled my church on a dilemma that happened within my congregation. Balconies filled up with, with the news media. Can I tell you what got me through is I had a people who loved me and said, Pastor, we love you regardless of what everybody else is saying. Can I tell you that I had a congregation that loved me through crisis in my life? That's what got me through to say, God, we're going to build a $9 million sanctuary. We need somebody in our life that's going to push us toward Jesus, not to knock us down. There's somebody that's never going to like everything that we do. But for us, we're going to thank God for the minister, the man of God that he's put in this house. How many of y'all appreciate what the gift you've got in this house today? Anybody appreciate the gift? Do you really, really, really appreciate the gift that God has given? George Bonnet concludes by saying this. He says, but the pastor is not simply reflecting a lack of faith when the voice of concern that the people are giving less of themselves to the local church than they used to because volunteerism is declining. I thank God that Valley Church is a church that tells people the truth about the gospel. I go into a lot of churches that they're afraid to mention heaven and hell because we don't want to turn anybody off. But you guys have pastors here that don't mind sharing because they want to see you on the other side, which is heaven. Amen. I'm glad that we don't sugarcoat the gospel down. I'm glad there's no compromise here because right is still right and wrong is still wrong. Heaven is still real and hell is still hot. Amen. I'm glad that we have pastors today that care about their congregation enough that if you don't leave here sometimes bloody and feeling miserable because you're in sin, that all of a sudden we're in the wrong place because I want to be convicted here before it's too late. Amen. And you've got a pastor that is searching for your soul, that's preaching the word of God and is saying, you've got to make it to heaven amen and I want you all to be on that side whenever the time comes but so many times we water down the gospel because we're afraid that somebody's going to be hurt somebody's going to be offended and we allow people to walk into hell that's not your pastor he does it in a way that he loves and a way to share with you of what is right and what is wrong and to that we want to recognize them and commend them for eight years of successful ministry but can I tell you the best days are still in front of you can I tell you that the greatest vision that your pastor has ever had is still yet to happen in his life the best is yet to come
I believe those doors are going to open with drug addicts coming in. I believe that there's going to be ambulance pulling up with people that have been given a terminal diagnosis, but yet God is going to heal them. I believe that there's a greater building because there's more people in Roanoke that needs to be saved. I believe that because you built that building, that there's doctors and lawyers and missionaries and preachers that are being raised up right now. And the enemy doesn't want any of that to happen. But when you have a man with a vision and you say, God, I know what's going to happen. He's holding up his hands and saying, church, we got to fight. We got to go forward because we're taking the city of Roanoke and we're telling the enemy he cannot have our children he cannot have our marriage he cannot have our finances he cannot have anything that belongs to me that is your pastor so I want today for us to honor them by blessing them is it okay if we pray over them Every week they pray over you. Every week they bring people up and they intercede over them. But today, can we take one day and just bless your pastors in prayer? Can we lay hands on them and say, God, give them a fresh anointing? Can we pray that God would give them a fresh vision? Can we pray that God would give them a special love? Can we pray that God would give them everything that they have? Pastors, would you all come for a, a quick moment? I want us to lift up hands. And I want everybody to stay in and I want you to raise your hands toward your pastors today. Because nobody understands the sacrifice of a pastor but another pastor. I have said in janitorial positions, I have said in, in associate pastor, I've said in youth pastor, I've said in all those seats. But can I tell you there is no seat heavier than the senior pastor position. No heavier seat. But when you have a heart for people and you love people, when you love people so much that it doesn't matter the pain that you feel, that you just want people to do better and you want them to succeed, that's the heart of a pastor. That's the heart of this man and this woman of God. I would love to say we honor pastors because they just have so much success but nobody knows how many lonely days are on the other side of that door in 1999 I found myself in Baton Rouge Louisiana sitting in the corner of a hotel room crying like a baby for three days because I had nobody to talk to and I flew there to talk to another pastor that got there. The pastor's like, I'm way too busy. I don't have time. And for the next seven months, my body declined. I went through tremors. I went through panic attacks. And we were getting ready to build the biggest building I had ever seen in my life. And I was afraid. And I just needed somebody. And I walked through that door on that third day. And my wife looked at me. And she fell to the floor. And she said, what is going on? And I said, I just need somebody. That's what I want to be to your pastor. He stands up every Sunday and smiles, but you don't know some of the pain he carries. You don't know how hard your words can be for somebody who has sacrificed their life to love and serve you. You don't know how nasty a text message or something you foes can hinder something that he's got to stand and he still has to encourage everybody else. Today, this is my passion. I want you to understand that you've got a good pastor. You've got a good pastor. And don't let your words speak idle words against them. Father, right now, God, I pray over Pastor Jason and Pastor Susie. God, I pray your anointing upon them like never before, Father. And in the times of their valleys, God, lift up their head and let them see the mountaintop. In the moments that they don't feel well, God, I pray that God, you send somebody to lift up their tired hands, God. God, in days they want to throw in the towel and give up, God. I pray that you would be there, too, God, just to help them see the other side and what's coming next in their life, Lord. God, for those who don't understand the position of this senior pastor, God, have mercy, have mercy and compassion upon them. Because, God, they have sacrificed their life to serve others. 
God, this is not a perfect man. It's not a perfect woman. It's in front of me, God. But they are your servants. Neither was Moses perfect. But God, you called him to lead the children out. And you had Aaron and her beside him to lift up holy hands that refused to do anything to hurt them, God, because they knew that if they let his hands down that they would lose the battle. God, put more Aaron and hers beside him, God, to lift up hands. Put those ladies around Pastor Susie, God, when she gets weary, to encourage her, to love on her, God, and to give her words of affirmation in the name of Jesus. Today, God, we think that we're touching heaven by doing what you have called us to do. And that's to honor the man of this hour for just one day. God, I thank you, God, for the pastor of this church. Be everything that they have need of the hour they need it the most. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. Thank you, guys. Can I tell you that the highest suicide rate in the world for pastors is right now? Because they feel like they can't do enough good. They can't please everybody. They sacrifice their life, their family, their finances, and it's still not enough. Today, will you lift up your pastor's hands? And I want to do this. I came in today and I, I, I just had him to go to the board because I didn't know where to go. And I said, hey, I want us to bless your pastor. Is it okay if we bless him today? Is it okay? Listen, this is what, this is what, this is what I want to do. They're getting ready to celebrate 30 years of marriage. They've never been out of the country. I want you guys to take them out. I want you to send them out of the country. I want them to go push away. Jesus got in a boat and pushed away. I want to see us send them away. Is that okay? I left my gift already on his desk. I want you to sow a seed into them. And I'm not going to say, I need 20, 50. And I don't care what you do. But I think everybody should do something. If he has ever blessed your family, can we take this one day, this one opportunity, can we bless them financially? I know some have put cards in the back. Thank you. But I want, when I leave here tonight, I want them to say there's enough money. We're going to send them to Rome or to Paris or something. I don't care. Somewhere away where they can get away from everything and push away. And watch when they come back with a new vision they're going to have. Will you guys do that for me today? Ushers, would you come? I want us to serve. I want us to serve well. And I want you to give as generous as you can, but to give whatever it is you want to do. Whatever you want to do is fine. And I know Pastor hates this, but I feel like it's God's will. He took care of Moses, and I think God wants you to take care of your Moses today. If you'll serve the people, God, thank you for every penny that comes in. God, we thank you, God, that this is a season and a time for pastors to get some rest as they push away from the shore for a moment. Thank you, God, for those generous givers in Jesus' name. I give myself away, oh, I give myself away, so you can use me, I give myself away, I give myself away, so you, come on the class, I give myself Amen. Can we just lift up one more hand clap of praise today? God is good. We serve a mighty God. And as we get ready to close today's service, Pastor Jason, Susie, I'm going to ask if you guys will head out to the lobby so as we dismiss, everybody can love on you, say hello. Dr. Bono, ask if you'll go out there with him as well. Are you thankful for the word brought forth today from Dr. Bowen?
I do believe that the best is yet to come. The Valley Church, the last eight years, God has, has blessed this church, and God has been good, and he's been faithful. But I do believe that the next eight years are going to be even better than they have been, even better than we can imagine of what we're doing for the Roanoke Valley and beyond to advance the gospel and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's what it's all about. And we've got the pastors here and Jason and Susie to lead us to cast the vision for us to submit underneath and to serve so that God can get all the glory and all the praise. Amen. Thank you guys for worshiping with us today. As we get ready to leave, if you will, please share with me in our benediction, Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you guys. Have a blessed week.